Okay. Uh, today's session is about uh, how we can use uh, Spring Cloud Gateway, which is basically implementation of API Gateway pattern in distributed application. And uh, how can what are the different services or feature does it has, and how we can you know utilize with the sample code. So. Let me share the presentation first. So Spring Cloud Gateway, or basically the API Gateway as we know it. Uh, we mostly find the API Gateway used in a distributed microservice pattern. But what may be the needs of API Gateway, what it fulfills? We know there are like maybe different kind of client. It may be other application client, which may be running as a native mobile application or an application that is running as a uh, desktop application or the application is maybe running as a normal web application right and different client can have like a different kind of uh, different kind of requirement or different set of APIs they wanted to access. So we can use the API gateway to break this APIs as per the clients. And also when we move to monolith to microservices, there is a different way we can you know, decompose monolith to microservice. One is known as a stangling pattern, where we can take a part of the application and convert that particular module into microservice and thereby strangle that particular monolith and gradually migrate in piecemeal manner. So in that case, what you can do, we can expose the migrated part of the microservices by the API gateway. And API gateway can isolate um, your services, right? It need not to be like a Spring Gate microservice. Uh, Spring Boot kind of a microservice. It can be your uh, Golang based service. It can be your Python microservice. It can be dotted microservice. It can be any service. So we can use the Spring API to work with a kind of right, polygot or multiple languages or framework with microservices, which gives a unified interface for the kind. And also certain cost cutting uh, features we can implement in the spring, uh, in the in case of microservices on the API gateway, instead of you know implementing them in the every services that we find, right? For example, obviously we can see there is like security, so in security, what we have is like, uh, we need to authenticate that particular user. So you know, implement that into the each of the services, we can put it into the API gateway or in the Spring specific world is the Spring Cloud Services. Similarly, uh, to know about the logging, the tracing and other things, we can observe how the API request has been processed. That we can also utilize. And also for resiliency, right? For example, if the other microservice, one service is calling another service and that particular service is down, then in that case, um, we can implement retry, we can implement timeout, and other like a circuit breaker kind of a resiliency pattern at the microservice level, rather than implementing them on the each of the services level. So microservice sits at the edge of your distributed system, with which the other applications or client basically interact. So for example, here is a basic simple, you know, a library software system where it has three microservices. One is your book service, which 
is basically functionality of managing the library books. Then you have an account service which manages that member subscriptions, member subscription renewal, or what kind of account it has, right? Another service is basically for giving out the books to the user. So user can take the book to their home and read on this, or can loan that book to the particular user. And all of these services are not directly exposed to any kind of content, right? Or any kind of uh, post system, or maybe kind of a centralized uh, library systems in other places. So they basically going to be go through via a aid service. And this aid service is basically going to have the, all the cost cutting concerns being implemented out here. So for this, we have Spring Cloud Gateway, which acts as a AS service or API gateway. And if you need to access the Spring Boot services, you have to go through this particular AS service to interact with that. OK, maybe you wanted to take a stock of what is the kind of inventory it has. It may want to add a new kind of a book to that, or you have purchased or increased the inventory, or the reading journal, et cetera. OK, so you have to go through by the aid service to the book service. So it is act as a age gateway. So it's at the age of your network, of your backend microservice distributed application. Normally, uh, what you know is that we normally use Spring Boot in a sublet container like a Tomcat or JT, where the request is being processed by a thread on the each of the requests. So each of the requests are comes in, they goes through the thread pool, right? That are being assigned to a each of the thread request. And they will be wait for the result or in a blocking state. And this thread pool is managed in your sublet container. Like example that we normally can find. When you use the Spring MVC kind of model or the framework that it is being used in a. Sorry, so are you feeling okay? Are you okay? Yes, yes, I'm okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. This Spring uh, thread pool contains within that particular container. So whenever the request comes against the request, one thread has been associated. So for example, you are doing a database operation or you are doing a file operation. So what happened is your thread get blocked unless there is a response is coming. Okay. And your dispatcher sublet is going to then associate the thread and put the thread and send it to your handler or your controller as the case may be and there your request get process depending on which framework you are using that we are daily use and the downturn is that that when you have like a lots of blocking operation and the lots of you know threads are coming what happen is your main user have to wait for the free threads to be available from the thread pool of your uh, sublet container and is uh, the request will take longer to get process or most probably you get a denial of service request because there is not free threads are available and we know that in spring boot there is also like a, another way of writing reactive Spring Boot application using so Webflux. So how the Webflux is different from this? So here the request response are not being associated with a single thread, right? Each request and response is first stored up in an event queue. So when the requests are come up, it goes into an event queue and they are going to be from that particular event queue the order in which the requests have been coming up, 
they will be scheduled in a event loop. So in the event loop, you have fewer number of threads, and here they are going to be schedule the event. It goes to the event loop, and here the difference from the last is that they don't going to be wait for a request result rather. So they basically register a callback method where the response is going to come up. Okay. And they goes on and then they pick up the next uh, event from the particular event queue and register another uh, callback against that. And when the operation waiting completed or the callback is been called, then they pick up that from that result queue and then they going to be triggering that particular event queue on the particular result and the result being then sent back to the client. So here uh, the main threads pool is are used with minimal number of threads and they can process multiple threads because they are going to be using a separate queues for registering incoming request and also outgoing responses okay and this is we can find that in spring boot we have two kind of stack one is synchronous or blocking io one is a asynchronous or non-blocking io one is a subless stack another is a reactive stack so basically uh, any kind of framework you have generally the route routes are mapped the url path to a particular functionality so here what you do on the spring mvc side you register different uh, classes with the meta annotation risk controller and then you map that methods with the patterns and in case of the spring web flux we have seen previous example where we basically register a route router where the router basically holds the method reference of a particular handler class and the url that is going to be mapped and then obviously in the spring mvc side you have these things run on sublet apis you have http sublet request and response and it is run on either tomcat or jt kind of a like a sublet container right on the spring webflux side it is basically reactor stream adapters are used okay where we have the mono or flux depending on a single or multiple responses we are returning they have a separate request and response and they basically use niti or any sublet 3.1 and upper version of container which provide those event loop and event queues and the main library remain the same it is spring boot and the associated libraries that are there okay so here uh this so this is the what is the routing looks like the client send a request when the client send a request the request can be mapped to a particular service downstream service right and that particular downstream service is given a unique name and then there are like different predicate or condition simple condition may be your http request hidden need to be matched and they will be forward that or you have a certain uh, path URL, okay. So based on those predicate, you just forward the request to a downstream service, okay. And where the cross cutting concerns are being met out here, you have like a wave handler, which is the P filter, and the post filters are also there, okay. And then that particular downstream service has been request 
when you request p filters can be done they can modify the request and the responses body or they can add a new header or remove a header or modify the header value etc they can add a, any kind of request uh, parameter they can be add or remove or modify that so whatever in p filter what happened your http request is basically processed and it can be modified and when the response is back from the downstream service there can be post filter can be added so it can add additional request uh, headers or modify the body import the body or decode the body whatever may be the case they can perform those operation so let's see some uh, sample code that is there Let me open up. Let me try to put the path right here. So here we have the age service and the book service. So let's just see the quickly the book service. So in the book service is basically a very basic Spring application. So book service application is there. Okay. So here is the book service application. What you have is the normal Spring Boot annotation, Spring Boot application and spring boot application run with the spring boot application dot class and argument and then you have a record type which is basically our case is a dto or pojo object which is holding only the title book title then you have the risk controller so it is just a spring mvc implementation and also we have seen the spring mvc implementation can be merged with your uh, annotations can be merged with your spring reactive application so here we are returning multiple books so get books we are returning multiple objects so we are returning flux here we are mapping get mapping books and just individual books names are given and do first returning the list of books that are there okay now out here in the application.yml, there's nothing much. This service is runs on the port number 9001. And uh, that's for now. Now let's look into the A service or the Spring Cloud Gateway service. So in the Spring Cloud Gateway service or A service, we just uh, have one each service application which is just simply spring boot service and there is nothing more as per c the main things are in the configuration so in the configuration apart from the application name uh, let's minimize the security for now 
So here you have the Spring Cloud Gateway Pacific, right? Now in the Spring Cloud Gateway, first is your routes are defined. Which routes the request will go through? Here is the book route has been defined by the particular ID. So now is the book route will be mapped to a particular URI. So either it can be book service URL environment variable or in absence of that particular environment variable, it will forward it to the local host 9001. Now there need to be a predicate. So in this predicate, it will be just a path, path of books. So whenever the URL has starting with the books, start, start, then that particular books will be called and based on the book that particular path will be redirected to your book service or here in this case your local host 9001 okay and your service itself this service or a service is going to be running on the service port 9000 And here, there are like pre-processing and post-processing examples. So these are basically implemented using filters. So what kind of filters they are using? They are using filter like add request header. So add request header becomes your pre-filter or pre-processing filter, which is like say you associate a multi-tenant application X tenant which has a name called Acme and then you have a, like a post processing or post operation after the response has been there. So pre filter and post filter where you having like add response header and here you are adding your own custom header with a tag called fantasy right. So that being said So that's how the application is there. And these applications are generally can be built. And here you basically using dependency like Spring Starter Actuator. And you have some basic gateway. So you are taking the Spring Boot, Spring uh, Framework, Spring Cloud Starter Gateway. So that you are taking. and here you are using webflux, so you are taking spring boot starter webflux. Rest there is we're going to come later on. And in the Docker file, what we have is we are using from multi-stage build. So there are two parts. One is for builder. Uh, that is for running your, your application. So it is taking Eclipse Comedian 17 as the JDK version or base image as builder. It created a workspace, uh, work directory that is workspace. They're adding an argument like jar files, which is they're going to be pick all the jar files that are there in the Path under build.leap.jar, and then they're going to have like copy of the jar file as age service.jar, and then they're going to be simply extract jar mod layer root jar, and they're going to be extracting that particular application using Java jar command. and extra and then based on the same base image now they're going to be adding one user named spring and then they're going to be using that user under spring to run it as it is not advisable to run against the root user under your docker image and there is like a work directory 
that is workspace and then from there they are copying from the builder the workspace dependency bootloader snapshot dependency per application for that they are basically calling the jar launcher yes so actually I, I have a question that if i have to like write this docker file i will write it by myself or like how should i approach yeah you can write it yourself so basically here it's showing multi-stage docker builder and writer mm -hmm. so that is like an advanced example very basic or simple example maybe you just choose a base image maybe alpine version 17 or 18 and then you create a user you choose a work directory and then you use the user and you basically copy the build jar file so jar file building will be outside the docker pool, docker command or docker build image and you just copy the jar file and you simply use java dash jar and then you run the application okay 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 so this means this service has been given similarly the other service docker file has been given the same way both of them are using that now so this each service and this service book service going to be working and for that what you need to do we have created a docker compose where you have choosing a particular uh, image from a particular source location or you can choose a build path also okay and you are depending on the fluent bit or key clo you are opening up the port you are putting the service name ping security auth and logging you are using fluent and the a service is again you are choosing another pre-built image or you can build the image locally and then you are choosing Redis, Peacock, etc. Ravana image, etc. Loki, you are choosing, etc. You are choosing. So let us try to run this application. And see if we are able to run it or not. So we're going to be using Docker Compose is going to be up but before that i need to start the rancher desktop WSL is not running. What so no who is to
Okay. It may have an issue. It may not run. Let me try. Otherwise, we just go with the code work through from now. So demon is not getting started. So let me kill it and try to run it. Otherwise, we just go over the code for now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyhow, uh, this is not running, but let me explain the code. So I have to go to the IT to fix this. So basically, in your book service, there is not much, but in your A service, as we have seen before. So if you need to route the request, what you need to do, if I just minimize everything, if I need to write a request, I have to first mention that I'm using under spring colon service, uh, sorry, spring cloud gateway that is in yml or spring dot cloud dot gateway and then we can use dot routes and then we use the id that is book routes and the uri is basically nothing but your local host server or a server url that you're going to be getting from the environment path then comes your predicate. Here is a path-based predicate has been used. Header or other query parameter-based predicate is not used. Then our, as per this, we have p filters and post filters. So p filters is coming up x tenant acme, which is adding a request to the header before it's sent to the book service, and the post filter is after the response coming from the book service you are adding one more header into that okay so that let you know how you can you know set up speak cloud gateway to act as the api gateway and do the routing between one service to the another service so far, any question on this? Okay. Let's talk about observer plating. So how we can observe what is happening within the applications? how the request is moving from one service to another service or API gateway or each service to our service right so there we have the grafana the open source observability stack here it has like three different things one is any kind of logs you want to collect from the individual containers right so that you can collect using Grafana Loki, which is basically collects your log, the log that we route right from your applications. And these logs are also your, your logs, what you have write from the application, or the logs that are the framework classes generates. So how to move these logs? to the Grafana server is what is the Loki is take care of. It basically collects the logs from your container. And here the logs are not, you know, we are not talking about collecting the logs in the CloudWatch or other. Here we are using a separate server to storing the log. Next comes is the trace. So along with the log, 
to see how the request is moving from one request to the next container or the next path one API to another API to another API, that where, where Grafana Tempo comes in. It basically takes care of creating log trace, how much time it spent in each of the, say, controller level or your database layer or your normal layer of your service layer. So those details, you can get it. And how much time it's spending overall in the service, that detail you can also get. How much time it's taking within the framework itself, that details you can also create in a different spans of request processing that is happening through different level. Then comes your Prometheus or Cortex, which basically collects the your matrices that we can save and these matrices are everything being shown in a Grafana dashboard. So for example, here is a sample of Grafana dashboard where you can, using Loki, you can see what are the logs have been generated and also you can search those logs if you wanted to to figure out if there is an error occur, which service the error has occurred from the log mean, which is mapped to your service, and you can look into the logs. Then from the log itself, you got to find there is like a tempo or the tracing is available. So if you open up the tempo, what you're going to see is your trace ID. So every request has been assigned a unique trace ID. And that particular trace ID gives you a trace view. So here you can see that how much time it's spent on the edge service in a multiple. So first it goes to the edge service. It spent a certain amount of time. Obviously it's a end-to-end -end request. Then how much time it's spending on the pre-processing part? How much service time it's spending on the book service? How much time it's spending on the controller service or database layer? and then how much time it's sending on post service and then how much the total request span for individual span basis that particular breakthrough you can create from grafana so how can we you know monitor this or what kind of you know dependencies i have to put or what kind of configuration i have to use So first and foremost, we have to include the observability related dependency. So normally we find that this observability related dependency Spring Boot itself gives you the Spring Actuator which is the different endpoint. You can see the logs, you can see the thread dump, you can see the head dump. You can also see the health of the application. You can see the configuration, etc. And here we're going to use micrometer registry Prometheus and also open telemetry for all the different kind of tracing and matrix information. So these two we will be using or seeing that. Similarly, on the A service, we have added that. And also, let's go into the book service. So in the book service, we have the Prometheus and SIM print telemetry that is there. And if you look into the application configuration of book service 2, Here only changes we can see for this is the logging pattern and the logging pattern expression has been given. So what is in the log going to contain? It's going to contain the spring application name that's going to come from spring application dot name property. Then it's going to have the trace ID and the span ID. 
that will be auto generated so every log that is there either we are creating or from the um, our application we are running so those details will be captured out here along with the trace id and other details that are there so here we are storing the log returning a list of book in the catalog so this custom log that we are writing so that going to be printed with the application name that is the book service followed by the log entry and the log entry followed by the application name and then followed by the your trace id and your other configuration that you have put that is your span id so similar configuration we're going to be finding most probably under your a services as well so let us quickly check the same kind of a pattern has been given out here okay so based on this whatever logs are there so those logs will be presented in the following pattern here there is no log as such so all the application or the framework logs will come under there okay and also your management endpoint web exposure including star so all your actuator endpoints have been enabled and you can view those application endpoint as the case maybe you wanted to use the actuator and then you can get that on the actuator health info then in means log etc detail you can get it so that's the first section on the monitoring so actuator we know health metrics we if we're using flyway so flyway detail thread dump etc we're going to get and also we're going to get the distributed trace that you have seen open telemetry we have introduced and spring cloud sleuth those details will be captured now let's talk about resiliency resiliency means when the requests are being actually processed right there may be that some your age service has a book route and the particular book route is basically calling the your book service the book service can return 500 it can also return 503 not available or gateway timeout error right so those details can come, right? Those kind of error condition can come. So here, what is happening? Instead of you know sending the request back, right? After the first failure, you rather going to do the retry mechanism. So first, you send an HTTP request that goes to the book service. Book service return you a 503 error, and then again you retry. With the same HTTP request, again you get a 503 error. Now maybe on the third time you have again retry, and then you receive successfully HTTP response after that many second retry. So how this? Uh, so this is is something that you enable on the API gateway level. You are not writing this on the book service. Or anywhere else okay so let's see the configuration for the retry so obviously this is going to be now your H service so in the H service You're going to be adding one more filter as a retry. So this filter going to be a post filter, right? 
after the response was received, so whether it's going to be retry, that decision is going to be taken. So here in the retry, you're going to be choosing arguments. How many retries you going to do? So you may choose to retry only three times. You may choose to retry five times. So unless until you're going to get a response, you're going to keep on retrying. Right. Next is which methods you going to be retry. Say for example, I only want to retry the get methods. Now backup. What is the backup means? That when there is like a first between retry, how much time you going to be spending? And you're not going to be, you know, making a call. What is the delay? Okay, so backing up between retries. You're not going to overwhelm the downstream service. Rather than you're going to be wait for this to try after a certain interval. So there are two types of interval. Yes. So if you are using circuit breaker, then why 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 we are using the retry one? No, uh, circuit breaker is a different concept, right? Circuit breaker's concept is advanced than the your retry, correct? Where you are actually waiting to see the responses are being successful or not, right? So circuit breaker configurations are actually different. They're going to be also have like a fallback mechanism correct okay here in the retry there is no fallback mechanism you are not returning any other responses right and here you are choosing different other things here you are only just retrying you are just again sending the request in anticipation that services may be up between the back of time or delay I'm sending. Okay. So there is a difference between that two. Have we understood the difference out here? Both of the cases, either service is down or not returning anything. What you are doing in case of circuit breaker, you are having an alternative response that you are generating, maybe either from your local cache or a default results that you are introducing it, correct? But in case of retry, what happening is you are retrying only a certain number of times, right? And after that, you are giving up on the retry. And in between retry, you're just waiting. So first, back off is basically here is given a different value that is 15 millisecond. After that, the second data is going to go in. And if the second data is failed, then it will become maximum back of 500 milliseconds. So in between 500 milliseconds, it can make a call. But there is no fallback mechanism is there. OK. So if what if I write this always in the fallback method only? Like in this first back of max back of all this. No, things. also like uh, apart from fallback mechanism, it has a different way of determining the open state, right? Or half open state. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 So we're going to be looking into that configurations also. Okay. That one. Then there is a another uh, limit is how many requests your system may be processed, right? So you can choose to rate limiting, right? So in case of rate limiting, what happened is you will start throttling the incoming request. If there is a number of requests 
which is more than maybe what you find you know your server or your service can process 200 requests per second okay and there is like a 200 watt or 210 requests per second. so in that case you set a limit right when you enable the request per limit, then your request processing time or the responses that you see is taking up more and more time, right? So more requests you onload on that particular server, it will take more time to processing the request because it has a certain capacity limit in terms of number of thread, in terms of number of CPU or memory. So there you can choose to rate limit or request limit within the per second, how much you're going to be allowed it to process. So if the request is reach or go beyond that particular rate limit, you're going to be getting the request has been process. Okay. Now, if we're moving to service, a bit better, let us come out to the time limiter and we'll fall back. So what is the time limiter? So time limiter going to be wait on the request response sorry response processing down. Okay. So response processing time, what is going to do is basically it's going to send a HTTP request and it's going to be set up a limited number. Say I want to expect the request to be written under one second. So in this case, even if the request is eventually successful, but it takes one, one second or two second time, more than one second time, then what happened is what happened is that it going to be thrown exception is that the timeout has been expired. Either it can have a fallback defined. So if the time limit has been more than that, then it's going to be go through that particular fallback and return the response. OK. And if there is no fallback determined, so it basically throws a timeout exception. So let's see the configuration for this. So obviously, just like the previous configuration, this configuration is given over here. Time limit. So in the time limiter, what is saying? On the instance of the book service, there's a timeout duration of three seconds. So what is the book service? So this is, again, coming from the resilient 4G package of that particular dependency, where you are defining the time limit. So you are depending on that particular instances and the timeout duration you have set three seconds and there is no fallback has been defined. So when the no fallback has been defined, 
what happen is is automatically going to be get the timeout error if any of the requests is taking more than three seconds okay Now come back to the circuit picker. Okay. So there are like different threshold which are going to be configured and which are going to take it to from open state to half closed half open state to closed state. Okay. So we have gone through the circuit breaker pattern differently. Now just look into the configuration and different uh, times that are there. So circuit breaker has been added. And it has the fallback URI that has been defined as a forward to book fallback. Where is the book fallback is been defined? The book fallback is defined out here in the same service within the eighth service. But it can also be you know falling back to the other service, which can define an empty result. It need not to be part of the eighth service or the spring cloud gateway service it can be something else so that service can return it and here it just returning the empty flux results right if the book is not written but it's not throwing any error so on the a service what happened is that here is the book name, instance name has been given, and the fallback URI has been given, nothing much. And the circuit breaker pattern or the P request filter has been added. So out here, what is saying? So failure rate threshold. Failure rate threshold is been given as a 50. And wait duration in open state, how long it's going to be open? Stay in the open state, it's uh, 10 seconds. Okay. And parameter number of calls in half open state is five. Okay. So let's map these things into the diagram. So first is, the time it will going to be wait in the open state is 10 seconds. Okay. So then from that, after 10 seconds, it's going to go into the half open state. Okay. And tip the breaker after the failure rate above the threshold or below the threshold. So either it can be again open or go below that particular rate, right? So out here, what is the rate is given? The half open state, the rate is given is 5. So if the failure rates are more than 5, number of failures, Permitted call number of failures are five. Five requests has been given out here. And within the five, if the 50% have been failed, then it goes to the open state. If less than 50% has been failed, it goes into a closed state. 
okay and it is going to be taking this calculation based on a sliding window or the last 10 request okay so from the last 10 request you're going to pick out the five and you're going to calculate what is their status whether they are successful whether they are failure if they're successful what is the success rate if it is uh, what is the error rate if it is above 50 percent then it goes to a close state if it is below 50 percent it goes into sorry it's go below 50 percent goes into a closed state if it's above 50 percent it goes to a open state okay so last state request more than 50 percent goes in open state still says say, 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 the open state to go into the half open state and for the half open state again it got to be wait for five requests and within the five requests it try to calculate okay find and in that case, the five requests has been there. It's going to be checking. And then if it is above or below 50% the error rate, it's going to go either in again into the open state or into the closed state. So I hope that we have understood the circuit picker, time limiter, and the return mechanism, the T kind of resiliency pattern that we can pick up for our need right now the another resiliency pattern that we have talked about is the rate limiter so for the rate limiter what we need to do is we need to use a ready server okay and against the route against the path you have to add request rate limiter and you have to say radius rate limiter you're going to be using and the URI that is there, right? And that's how we can do this. And the radius rate limiter also can be taken the number of requests. Now, also, this can be uh, mapped to a particular client, right? So, rate limiters are always per client. So, basically, if the requests are coming from a particular IP address, so remote IP address, so where is coming from the remote IP address, you have to check. You add the Redis rate limiter, and you going to be using the key resolver, which is basically a client address resolver, simple client address resolver. So based on which you can configure the rate limiter that is there. But some cases, uh, what happened is that uh, this kind of configurations, you can do both in uh, Excel code and also you can do this configuration also in the YML code, right? So here in the route after the predicate, you have to add a separate key resolver, which could resolve based on the IP address per se. And you're going to be using Redis and you choose the replenish rate or burst capacity, etc. Those values you can set. So request rate limiter, you're going to be setting up replenish rate that is 500, burst capacity 1000, and the request rate token 1. So those configurations you can do. You can choose your own configuration uh, using your. So those are basically another mode of four patterns. We try rate limiter, circuit breaker, and timer. Again, we are seeing that these operations are being performed by 
your circuit breaker. You don't have to write any additional code elsewhere. Now the last part remains is user authentication. So normally what happens is we know that we use the access token, we use the OAuth or open ID connect right over OAuth too. So here instead of you know authenticating on the particular server level, you can choose to authenticate in the API gateway or cloud gateway service itself. You can connect with the auth service itself and the end user can authenticate itself against the auth user service. So here you have now the open ID which is basically a protocol built top of OAuth 2. So what it does is enable the client to verify the identity of a user against a authorization service server, a trusted third party application, right? So here we can use key clock, which runs on a Wi-Fi, right? Which is a JBoss service, right? And that provides the access and identity management service. So that is the OAuth 2 authentication service. And your A service become your client application on behalf of that. So it's basically token management and authentication. It delegates to that particular server. And it's basically then issues the ID token, which is basically have who is the subject, when the ID token going to be expired, who is the issuer, here is the key clock being the issuer, the subject or the principal is the Isabel, and the expiration is the long timestamp that is given. Now, when they're going to be requesting this service, how that particular token is going to be go forward, okay? So here you have like OAuth 2, if you don't want it to use open ID. So the difference between that here also client get a limited access to a protected resource. And protected resource is being provided by another application that is your resource server. So resource server may be your any kind of service. It can be your book service, loan service, or your account service, right? It's not just any HTML patches, it can be any API that is there. So here, basically, the we use a session cookie. And for the session cookie, it's been mapped using the access token. And that with that particular access token, the token has been for to book service, resource service, or your other services that are there. Now this access token which has been generated is basically having the same kind of a detail, like it's issue as a click of subject and expiration. So let, before that question answer, let us see the example of how this can be done on the configuration in your a service. So in your A service, you have to give the one security bin you have to enable. So anything kind of security filter chain you have to configure. So here security web filter chain has been configured with server HTTP security and here you are authorizing the exchange matcher endpoint request to any endpoint you are matching you are actually permitting all users and any exchange other exchange need to be authenticated what to login is the customizer with the default so that's the basic configuration that's there. 
now coming to the application.yml so here comes the security part of the cost cutting concern in the security part of the cost cutting concern you have security was to climb registration is basically key clock so with the key clock and that client id this particular server client id is a service client secret is certain secret that is given and scoopy open id okay similarly the provider here will be click of two and then what is the issuing url for the particular service is the key clock url which is basically your 8080 port it got to run auth and it has created a particular polar bookshop or separate relay for this the session related details are basically stored in a radius so all your session cookies are stored out here and here the default filters has been enabled save token sorry token relay token relay is coming and token relay is basically going to be taking that particular same token from the converting the session cookie so session cookie or session storage going to be using redis and token relay will convert that session cookie to the access token that will be forwarded to the services the request rate limiter example has been given here the past replenishment and the request rate token that has been given out here so all this configuration has been there now let's see what is the service level configuration we have to do so again here we have to say these are my resource servers right and this server is going to be go to the key clock URL, and within that URL, they're going to be having polar bookshop, the particular <laughs> the access token that has been shared to them. Okay, and using the same access token, they can call the other services too. So that's the uh, basic some of the configuration of the features of Spring Cloud Gateway. So if you guys have any question, you can ask them. Any questions you have? No, I don't. Okay. So basically, if you want to okay. So next thing, what you need to do is just to recap. What are the cross-cutting concerns we are handling out here? What is the main functionality of API Gateway is? The API Gateway is basically first doing the routing. Routing to different backend services. It can be Spring Boot or other more microservices. What are the cost cutting concern it's doing? It's doing resiliency using rate limiter, circuit breaker, return, and also these are the four different patterns with. Then comes the observability. So observability, it can work with open telemetry details 
and logging detail. Logging detail in case of Grafana, it has been captured by Loki. And the tracing detail has been captured by Totem. And then the normal Grafana, you have the Prometheus, which is storing the detail of the matrices. And the dashboard is provided on top of Grafana. And you can also monitor using your Spring Cloud monitoring systems and open telemetry and slope. Security, you can enable security using a third party service, either using Open ID or OAuth2 portable schemes where the different ID token and access token has been issued by the particular authentication servers. And these servers can also leverage Redis to create the security context propagation using token relay. OK. So if you guys don't have any further questions, we can in the session now. So, uh,